episode 43, I had a question coming out of chapter 9, number 73. So I want to just head through this problem. So the, the first question, part A asks, are we in mean land or proportion land? And there are a couple of clues that you're in proportion land. A, a big one is that you can see the word percent running through the problem. The other thing that I, I think about for me is if, if I was talking about the variable in this problem, if I was one of these 100 people surveyed in this, in this example, they would be asking me whether or not I suffer from depression or a depressive illness, but I'll put suffer from depression. And I would answer, oops, let me spell that correctly. I would answer yes, no, or maybe I don't know, something like that. But this is a categorical variable. All right, and anytime I'm in, uh, excuse me, anytime I have a categorical variable, I'm in proportion land. And again, if you had thought of this as, um, I'm gonna keep track of the number of people who are suffering from depression or a depressive illness, Here, let me write this down, who suffer from depression. If you think of it in those terms, right, that's fine. Just keep it in mind that if you're talking about number of, that is a frequency, right? And whenever we have a frequency, we, we tend to convert those toward to relative frequencies, right? When we divide by sample size, right? And another word for relative frequency is proportion. So either way, we're getting over to proportion land. All right, and our proportion, our, our null and our alternate is we're claiming that 9.5% of American adults suffer from depression. So I have the null, at least for this, for this town, right? Um, we're going to say, hey, we're going to assume the depression rate in this town is the same as the nation, right? But then the town is just curious if the folks in their town or in that town um, suffer from depression at a lower rate than the general population. So our alternate is this less than symbol. All right, and that heads us into, like I said, now I'm into part B. And part C is asking, is this left-tailed, right-tailed, or two-tailed? Well, if you have a less than, I know we haven't gotten there yet, but when we draw the sampling distribution and we get our test statistic, whatever it is, I'm going to shade the left side of that. I'm always going to go less than it because my alternate is less than. So that's why I'm going to say I have a left-tailed test. Okay, the next, per or the next question said, what symbol represents the random variable? So you could give me a couple of them. You could give me the X spiel, right? And I don't care which version you give it to me in, or you could convert it to proportions. But ultimately, because we're in proportion land, we're gonna have to get to that P prime um, anyways. So whether or not you start with just a straight up categorical variable or a discrete numerical variable, we're all going to head over to the P prime version. We've got to get over to proportion land. And I had seven successes, 100 trials. That makes my statistic, right? This is my sample proportion. All right, that P prime is about 7%. Now, the next part asks you, hey, can you calculate the standard error? And it's not super clear. I know they use sigma sub x there. I, I'm going to put p prime. Again, I don't care which notation you get. But ultimately, when they talk about the standard error here, it's always the denominator in steps 9 and 10. So denominator in steps 9 and 10. And so... Your book's getting really into the weeds on what is called what. Like, is this thing called sigma of x or is it called sigma of p prime? I'm not really worried about that. And I don't want us to get too caught up in, okay, I didn't use a p prime here. I used an x. Because ultimately, we're going to run this hypothesis test. And, and the conclusion and the p value, those 13 steps, those are what's important. And so when we get to h... It says, hey, state the distribution used. Now, before I even go to which distribution I would use, and it would, if we're in proportion land, we would use the Z distribution. But before I can say I can use the Z distribution, I need to check my assumptions. Didn't have a random sample, that's okay. But I, I also didn't meet normality, right? And that's not okay. So I would have stopped the problem. You can see this note here. I would have stopped the problem because, um, excuse me, before running the hypothesis test because normality wasn't met. And while I love your book, um, because it's free, your book, and, and some folks say you only have to have five successes and failures. 
I, I disagree with that, but it's okay. We can all disagree on things. That's fine. And I'm going to go ahead and run the problem out just so you can see the mechanics of this anyways. So, okay, if it has to be greater than or equal to five, then we're on the Z distribution and we're good to go. If I want that P value, the first thing I need to do is get my test statistics. So this is going to be, oops, let me erase that. This is the equivalent of steps nine and 10. <coughs> Excuse me. So my sample proportion was 7%. My null proportion was 9.5%. I've got that standard error there. And when I crunch that number on my calculator, I get this test statistic of negative 0.853. And just imagine where this is if we were going to draw the, the graph. I know we're not officially doing step 12, but if I wanted to, it's always good to practice, right? So zero would be under the peak. And you can think here, like, well, this would be negative 0 0.853. And keep in mind what we knew about the empirical rule, right? If we were at negative one here, we knew that there was 16% of area under the curve just to the left of negative one, right? Because this is always the 16th percentile. And I only mention that because we're even a little bit to the right of that, right? We're at negative 0.853. So let me go ahead and just try and get an idea, get some feelings. Oops, looks like I erased everything. Hold on. Let me see if I can be a little bit more explicit in what I erase. All right, let's see if I can erase just the pink stuff. I think I can. I feel like the little engine that could, but I did it. Okay. So if I want to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if I want to look at this area under the curve, let's go to negative 0.853. All right, and I'm going to head to the left. Let me grab something to drink. Oh, excuse me. Something was in my throat. Okay. Now, I want to go to the left of it because I had that left-tailed test. And if you don't remember, let me just scooch up here. All right? Keep in mind, we had a less than symbol here. So let me go shade the area to the left of that. All right, so let me get in here and shade. Something like that. Okay, and I expect that area to be greater than 16%, right? We had just said from the empirical rule that it's at least 16%. It's definitely less than 50%. Oh, I keep skewing that. It's less than 50, but greater than 16, right? So somewhere in here, I'm expecting a number between 16 and 15%. Okay, well, if I want to find the area under that curve, right? So I, I have my probability statement here. We've got our letter, which is Z. We've got our symbol from our alternate, which is our less than. And we've got our number from step 10. I know we're not technically calling it step 10 in, in this problem, but it would have been step 10 if we were doing that big free response write-up. Okay, so if I'm on the standard normal curve, I definitely want to use normal CDF. So I'm going to go normal CDF. We've got a little low, high, right? And I say low because if I was heading all the way this way, my low would be negative infinity. My high is negative 0.853. I've got 0, 0,1 for my mean and standard deviation. And when I crunch that number, I get 0.197, which that's great. That is between, just based on the empirical, empirical rule, that's in between 16 and 50%. So great. There's my p-value, right? So I know my p-value is of almost 20%. So let me just write here. My p-value is basically 20%, which is pretty high. That's saying that if the null were true, and let me let me scooch back up here, okay? If the null were true, and let me erase this because we've got so much stuff here, it's a little bit junked up. All right, all right. If the null is true, and the null is saying if the true proportion of folks in this town, right, that suffer from depression or a depressive illness, and again, this is in the town, if, if they really are at 9.5%, then the likelihood I would get a sample proportion of 7% just by chance, just through random variation, because again, when you run, some, uh, when you run a survey, something has to happen. So this outcome, how likely is that to happen just by chance? Dude, that happens 20% of the time if the null is true. And that's not that rare, right? So this, this is not rare. It does not make me suspect the null hypothesis. So I'm going to fail to reject the null. All right, and the reason for my decision is because my p-value is greater than alpha. And here we are saying, I don't have sufficient evidence that the proportion or the true proportion of people in this town suffering from depression is lower than the percent of the general um, American population. 
And if you wanted to see my work through the calculator, you can see me running a one prop Z test. There's my input. Right, so this is the input screen. This is the output if I had hit um, calculate. And here's the draw screen. And with the draw, I always add the test statistic into my graphs. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye.